Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out, whether here in person for a nice boxed lunch or virtually over the web, which is a very slick way of getting the warning and FERPA required announcement in Urs when you're like, we welcome our virtual guests, which you all should be aware of. So yes, it's all being recorded even more than it is usually just as a fact of our surveillance society. Um, so I wanted to give a sense of some sweep of the Berkman Klein Center and its history um, and some of the issues we've taken up and some of the puzzles that remain in transformed fashion even today that we're trying to work through and basically to invite those of you who aren't already involved, some of you uh, wonderfully are, um, to consider getting involved over the course of the coming academic year. And uh, we may not be unified on much, but I think it's fair to say that pretty much everybody these days appears to have partaken of this fresh can of a vague sense of unease about the state of the world and uh, the state of technology in general. There was a lot more, if not uh, unambiguous optimism, there was a lot more am uh, ambiguous optimism about it in past years. We're at a time now where uh, the fear level is quite high, and I thought it might be good to work it through and to think about a kind of how helpful it can be to have a broad theory or set of theories to understand the unease we might be feeling about technology. The days when you could just sort of slice and dice the law around it. We're sitting in the law school right now. We're a university-wide center, but began here at the law school. And uh, there was a time, say 2001, when you know, you'd have federal telecommunications law. And you could teach a class in this room about telecoms law. This particular book, um, 1,516 pages, weighing in at 3.6 pounds, the heavyweight champion of federal telecommunications law. Um, it's nice to see that it has uh, five-star reviews, including this one. This book was amazing. I could not put it down. The interesting and comprehensible writing was magnificently crafted and very thought-provoking. A real page turner. It does make me wonder whether this is, in fact, a real review from uh, Sarah Thorne, but it is a real name, at least. Um, and uh, her review has not apparently persuaded a lot of people as it was uh, 2.3 million ranked in books bestsellers, which is rather high by my estimate uh, given the datedness of it. So um, this kind of way of thinking about things can get you a little bit, but if you're really trying to get to the bottom of how you're feeling about technology, which way technology should go rather than just where is it and how is it regulated, uh, it can help to be a little bit more, uh, as I said, have some theory around it, some framework. One such framework, actually dating from the late 90s, came from uh, our colleague Larry Lessig. He wrote this um, rather interesting paper in the Harvard Law Review on the law of the horse, what cyber law might teach. And as you can see from the opening paragraph, he tells the story of a federal judge asked to keynote a conference in the new field of cyber law. And the judge was like, go home, everybody. There is no such field. It's like having a law of the horse, which is ridiculous. If you want to learn about law on horses, if it's about selling horses, why, that's contracts. And if it's about horses that kick you, why, that's tort law. And if it's riding away on a horse after robbing a bank, that's probably criminal law. Why do you need a law of the horse? And this was, and I still think is, a serious challenge to think of, both for a field called cyber law. Why is it just like, it's a computer. Let's do a course around it. Um, and even more recently today, when we think about algorithms and AI and other new kinds of fields about uh, how and why we might regulate, uh, it's good to have a framework. And Larry actually tried to offer one. Um, I should say, by the way, for anybody stuck in the back, there are a few seats towards the front, and uh, yes, and even in the middle, so um, don't be shy. Larry actually had a theory that he wrote up in several books, and uh, I'm about to give you my best capitulation of it in about 45 seconds. We live in the era of the tweet. But uh, Larry's theory was basically, you all, each of us, are an orange dot in the world buffeted by forces larger than we are. And law is one of those forces, and we kind of know how to think about law. There's a law that tells you what you can and can't do, and you might shake your fist at it and maybe even disobey it, but we have processes by which laws come into place. 
very familiar way of regulating us. He'd also say that norms can regulate us. There's social norms about if you show up a little on the later side, is it okay to come down the aisle and block people's views and take a seat, for example? And it's perfectly all right, I licensed it, but without my license, people might not do it. In fact, even with my license, people are still stubbornly in the back of the room. That's norms at work kind of shaping behavior. And then you have market. Market is uh, the fact that stuff costs something, and there are all sorts of structures around markets, and uh, the way that markets work can affect what you can do. If you can't afford something, then you're not gonna have it, and that's a fact of life. Um, you know, death and taxes, that kind of thing. And uh, finally, architecture, the structure of reality, for most of us, limits what we can do. And uh, gravity is just a law to be reckoned with even more implacable than, say, law emanating from a typical government. And that, interestingly, said Lessig, could also be thought of as software code. The kinds of code that shape our experience online affects what we can do, and in fact, maybe more thoroughly, if subtly, than the other forces around that dot. Because if there's a password prompt before you can get to something, uh, unless you're really good at wrangling code, you can't get past it, and that's just like, there's not even civil disobedience for that. He further said that law, in particular, could help shape the other forces. So if you were wanting to regulate this dot, you could directly regulate it, or you could try to affect each of these. You could make mandates about the way software has to be built. You could uh, affect the market by, uh, in the case of tobacco, simultaneously subsidizing it and taxing it on the other end. And depending on which nets out which way, uh, people might smoke fewer cigarettes, modulo the fact that it's terribly addictive. Uh, product placement from the CDC. And uh, that's the kind of thing that uh, makes for more subtle sorts of regulation. So Lessig says this is why there should be cyber law, because of the ways in which architecture made by humans, not law of gravity, but law of web browser, can affect us. And there's all sorts of ways that that is worth focused and sustained study. Now the other, to me, really interesting thing from back in the day was that the technology architecture that we found ourselves with at the turn of the millennium, don't get to say that very often, um, was one that was remarkably open, in part by historical accident. This was a hobbyist machine that, thanks to the invention of VisiCalc, suddenly invented um, uh, by uh, Dan Bricklin and Bob Frankston here in Boston, um, VisiCalc, the spreadsheet, got this thing into uh, uh, businesses around the world, and that became the platform on which everything was built. This happens to be a very old DOS machine. Uh, you can date it probably from the 66 number in the corner. Um, and I don't know, people remember the 66 number? And then there was a button next to it that you could press that would, what would it do? Turbo mode, yes, when you press the button, the uh, thing would run faster, the hamsters inside would like, start madly racing. I should say, by the way, here is a hamster-powered paper shredder. Um, the hamster runs on the wheel, and the paper in the top, thanks to the gear in the wheel, then becomes shredded down, and then the hamster can live in the paper afterwards. So that was just your reuse as a viable alternative to recycling product placement. But anyway, yeah, it does make you wonder, why not press the button and have the machine just run in turbo all the time? And I think the answer was Prince of Persia would run too quickly if you did that. So you had to be able to downshift. But the main thing of a machine like that is you hand it code, it runs the code. Any code you give it, it's like, OK, I'll do that now. Prince of Persia by day and VisiCalc by night, or probably the other way around. But that's the kind of thing that we shouldn't take for granted, but is a medium in which we swim, and was the basis for the entire off-the-shelf, and there used to be shelves with it, software movement and the shareware movement, that anybody could write code if uh, he or she possessed the skill, and then share it with others, maybe charge a fee, maybe not, that sort of thing, and you never know what you're gonna get. This is the box of chocolates theory of software that could lead in any possible, at the time, quite exciting set of directions. And the same claim about the PC, about the, the fundamental unit at the time of consumer interfacing with um, digital stuff, could be said about the networks. It might have been true that our networks, 
when we were going to have a global network would just be like AT&T, and like that would be it, and that's the network, and you're done. There were analogs to that in the early days, like this wonderful welcome to CompuServe with oversized buttons in case you had trouble maneuvering your mouse, but all of that was provided by CompuServe, and this wasn't just a website you visit. It wasn't a website, it was the network. You turn on CompuServe, you turn on your computer, and you say, I'm gonna go online. This was online, this was all there was if you were a CompuServe subscriber, and if you weren't, you'd have to pick another kind of network like this, like AOL or Prodigy or whatever. This turned out not to be our future. The network itself ended up basically as generative as that endpoint that would run any EXE that you handled it. And it has a rather peculiar architecture. This is so-called hourglass architecture, uh, developed through the wonderful processes of the Internet Engineering Task Force. And as shown here, it's basically meant so that it was ecumenical about what the network would run on. It was like, bring me your wires, your wireless, your, your things waiting to be structured as datagrams, and I don't care what they are, but they'll be able to talk to anything else, which is why you can switch from wired to Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi to your LTE in the middle of downloading something, and it basically will pick up OK. And at the top, it was meant to be agnostic about what you were going to do with it. The point of the network was just to put entities in touch with one another, and they'd figure out what they wanted to communicate about and why. So the World Wide Web was just another app on this generative network. There's no main menu to the internet. Think about that. The internet doesn't have a main menu. It doesn't have a CEO. It's just a collective hallucination that we engage in to say that we're going to exchange bits with one another facilitated by this thing in the middle that despite being in a law school where that would normally mean intellectual property, that is internet protocol, the free and open protocol by which anybody is given the skill to route bits and figure out how to connect to this network. This is a picture of the, uh, some of the early framers of the internet for their 20th anniversary uh, of the internet photo in 1995. By then it was the 20th anniversary. Um, John Postel, Steve Crocker, Vince Cerf, the original network showing that you can kind of build a network out of anything, although it is a matter, I think, of some lore that their network doesn't work. It goes from Steve's ear to Vince's ear, and then Vince's mouth to John's mouth, <laughs> which is deeply unsettling if these are the framers of the internet and they don't know how to string the tin cans. Um, but they ended up uh, as part of the Internet Engineering Task Force, an unincorporated group of engineers. This is a current homepage of the IETF, which is intentionally designed to put you to sleep and send you somewhere else um, rather than to IETF 100 um, uh, in Singapore. Uh, but if you want to go to IETF 100, fine. You don't have to sign up. Anybody is welcome, and you can uh, come and vote. Scott Bradner, who's here, can tell you all about it. Uh, there's money involved. How much money, Scott? Seven hundred persons attending in-person meeting and free online. Really? But there's a they've got to pay for the cookies, he says. <laughs> it's weird because the IETF benefits from every single registration in .org to the tune of approximately thirty million dollars a year. <laughs> but still have to pay for the cookies, so it's seven hundred dollars to show up in Singapore. Three hundred really? But Yes, and there is, um, uh, there is a complex set of cross-subsidizations as well. So if you can endure paperwork, so-called proof of work, then you can probably attend for less than 700 if you don't have it. Well, anyway, this is a rabbit hole we will not go down. The general idea is it's about as open as building a global network could conceivably be. And this was an old page when you're like, I'd like to join the IETF, and you used to get this message. It's not a membership organization. No cards, no dues, no secret handshakes, smiley face. It's a lo right, really? These are the folks who build the internet, they're like, hello! And um, it's very strange. And wonderful is uh, my general view of it. Um, but these are the folks that gave us the protocols that lets anybody communicate with anybody, and that doesn't presume uh, very much, if any, centralization of most of the functions. To move data around, instead of having the equivalent of FedEx 
be somebody to whom you entrust the data and they run it through the room. It's like saying we are the network we've been waiting for and I could just hand the data to you even though I don't know you and you'll hand it back to him even though I don't know him and it'll eventually get back to where it's going kind of the way that beer finds its destination at a Red Sox game down the aisle with very little tax being taken by the people who are routing the beer on the way. This may seem a bizarre way to build a network and uh, there is some question about whether the internet can really work. Uh, Scott is the one who uh, I think quotes IBM as late as 1992 as saying you couldn't possibly build a corporate network out of internet protocol. You have to have the IBM proprietary version. IBM turned out to be wrong on that. And uh, although I guess some internet engineers are like, it's still an experiment, the jury's out, early returns are good, but you know, <laughs> could be a data tsunami uh, right around the corner. And I, Scott, I don't know if it was you or David Clark who, who coined the bumblebee as the mascot. It was you, Scott Bradner, in the room, uh, sometimes secretary of the Internet Society, parent to the IETF, because you do need an address to sue them if you're going to want to sue them. That's ISOC's role. Um, so if you have any lawsuits for the IETF, Scott's here and collecting. Um, he coined the bumblebee as the mascot of the IETF because it's said that the fur to wingspan ratio of the bumblebee is too large and heavy for it to be able to fly, and yet miraculously the bee flies, and none of us knows why until substantial government funding in 2006 finally had us figure out how bees fly. We don't really have time to go into it. Suffice it to say, they flap their wings very quickly. But um, this is the kind of thing for which Wow, an open network that itself, speaking network, is ready to be reprogrammed by any, metaphorically speaking, network EXE that it is handed. That's pretty amazing. It's also the kind of thing between the network protocols and the endpoint protocols that uh, by welcoming contribution, possibly welcomes contribution from people who are up to no good, or people who are up to good but maybe just skip a beat. So the heart bleed vulnerability, uh, something you may have heard about before the last 18 additional vulnerabilities crowded it out of the news, um, was a particularly bad one. Uh, our fellow Bruce Schneier said that on a scale of 1 to 10 in Spinal Tap form, it was an 11. And, uh, it was thanks to this guy, Robin Segelman, a graduate student in Bavaria who was working on the SSL protocol that hosted the vulnerability. It's the thing that secures the communication between most browsers and most uh, servers, for example, many other uses for it as well. And many, many, many servers around the world use it. It had this catastrophic bug in it, and he was just like, my bad. He was like, I was working on improving it and had many bug fixes. <laughs> Things were great, except Mrs. Lincoln uh, I missed a validating variable containing a length, oops, and uh, there was this terrible catastrophic bug. It's like, well, he ought to be fired. It's like, no, no, no one hired him. He was just doing this to be nice. It's like, well, he ought to do it more carefully. And it's like, yes, he agrees he will do it more carefully. This is a weird thing to premise the security of our network on except for all the other things we could premise it on, including corporations like Equifax that are like, oh yeah, trust us, it'll all be fine. It's the kind of thing too that has organizations like the International Telecommunications Union, an arm of the United Nations, even though it predates it by approximately 100 years. Um, you can tell from its, <laughs> the ITU, yesterday's ITU of tomorrow. Um, <laughs> And they have a very strict hierarchy of how they work. And they created, I think, again, this is another find by Scott Bradner, who keeps an eye on the ITU's maneuverings, like the kids in Scooby-Doo watching the uh, evil custodian. There is the focus group on next generation networks to fix the broken internet, AKA the Faginigan. And uh, about 10 years ago, that came together. And of course, uh, the documents were generally secured, much more than $700 if you wanted to participate. In fact, I think you have to be a country to participate in the ITU. $1,000 as a, as, you can pay a few thousand dollars as a corporation or as a stupid individual. Oh, well, <laughs> very good. <laughs> uh, and they finally came out after several meetings with their new successor to hourglass architecture. Here it is in all its glory, the ITU Next Generation Network, connecting to this convenient brown box, the internet, so there is backwards compatibility. Uh, this is containing within the network all of the security that the internet, in fact, lacks 
And you do wonder sometimes, why shouldn't it have more in the middle? That itself is a religious debate that we can have a little later. But suffice it to say that this has not taken off. We are left with a generative network connecting to generative endpoints that then can be used in any number of ways that gives rise to a kind of culture that is itself a little angular and weird, that when it collided with the existing norms and markets and laws, it gave rise in the early aughts to some issues. I mean, this is the kind of copyright law that in America, there's all sorts of exclusive rights. If I were to sing somebody a song right now that wasn't Happy Birthday, which recently was liberated, uh, but if I were to sing a song, it'd be a public performance, and the ASCAP people might come and arrest me for doing it. You'd have the copyright police, especially because we're webcasting. Uh, we're just not very good. Unless we can fit into this exception written into federal law, which is it's okay if it's a performance of a non-dramatic musical work by a governmental body or nonprofit agricultural or horticultural organization <laughs> in the course of an annual agricultural or horticultural fair or exhibition, which makes you wonder, the first time you do it, is it annual? Or do you have to wait till the second time to know that it was annual the first time that you did it? That's the detail that the law had around what you could and couldn't do, for which the internet just was like, no, I don't think so. And it's like Sean Fanning could invent Napster as a student at Northeastern across the river. And like within a week, everybody's like, this is good. And it's like, from a network point of view, it's, yeah, it's called file transfer. The feature of Napster is it's file transfer of nothing but MP3s. Like it was less is more, and then everybody's copying music ripped from CDs that have no copy protection, because they were meant to go into CD players, but then computers had CD-ROM drives, and then because they could be reprogrammed, it was off to the races for anybody wanting to rip the CD and share it, and the world was not very pleased, which gave rise to some thought about, wait a minute, this orange dot may be uh, strong. Instead of all the things influencing it, you know, Sean Fanning, where is he in this zone, he's right here, and so are the rest of us so long as he can share Napster with us, which he did. And that itself was part of an era where there was thought that, wow, for better or worse, individuals are greatly empowered by this accidentally generative combination of PCs and network, and maybe we should change copyright law to accord with reality rather than changing reality to conform to copyright law. And uh, it's funny, because around this time in the early 2000s, uh, part of the uh, Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act was to retroactively extend copyrights. Turns out they don't last forever. They were about to expire after 75 years. So a bunch of stuff from the 30s, like Disney cartoons, were going to come free. And Congress hastened uh, unanimously to pass an act just retroactively extending those copyrights. Uh, out of our center, we started a challenge to that. Our challenge, to our own surprise, ended up in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, it was Larry Lessig's first Supreme Court argument ever and his second court argument ever, with the other argument having been arguing the very case in the circuit court below and losing in rapid speed. Um, so that was argued in the Supreme Court, and I'm sorry to say we lost seven to two uh, which uh, meant that the copyright term extension could happen. That extension for another 20 years is about to uh, come back into play. It was 1998, so 2018 will be an interesting year to see if they go back to extend it yet further. And uh, out of our loss, we were realizing that if you are creating something and you want to share it, forget Disney, just think of somebody with a cartoon he or she wants to share, uh, there was no easy way to indicate that you wanted to share it. So we ended up coming up with the idea of a counter copyright, which then turned out to be Creative Commons. This is a very IETF-like looking site. Uh, we just didn't know how to build a website. It wasn't that we were trying to drive people away. And um, we ended up uh, upgrading the site. These were licenses that people could use to indicate easily that they wanted to share what they were doing and then others could pick up on it. And it's had amazing success over the years in people using those licenses, retail and wholesale. Again, just an idea that started in a building on this campus that became, uh, I think it is fair to say, an international movement with chapters around thinking about how to share our work. And uh, that's the kind of stuff that when we think about what we're doing, it's not just publishing papers about stuff. It's like, well, let's start something. We can start something technologically, organizationally, 
culturally norms technology markets. But over the years, of course, we've also been aware that the simple story of like, it's open, it's generative, it's free, everybody wins, is a tough story to tell. Because the same magazine cover that celebrates Sean Fanny and like, data going everywhere, that's pretty cool. It's like, data going everywhere. Have a vague sense of fear and anxiety at all times. And to be sure, this is not a new concern. This is Life magazine from 1966 worried about insidious invasions of privacy by technology, but still having to sell magazines. So there's just a woman there with technology taped to her. <laughs> I'd be afraid of that too, but why doesn't she just remove it? I don't know. <laughs> Read to find out. Um, and you end up with Wired uh, uh, decades later talking about the NSA's latest, uh, latest data center and all sorts of controversies around the fact you have profusions of data everywhere and what some may celebrate or not with uh, the profusion of copyrighted stuff, uh, it would invert, those who celebrate wouldn't and those who wouldn't might, the fact that there's data that could be gathered by corporate or government entities. And there's been a lot found out about that, both through massive leaks themselves, where the government entity spying can't keep the secrets that they are spying, because that leaks, or just through Freedom of Information Act. You can FOIA stuff and learn all about it. So here's all sorts of things about Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act of 2008, and you can read up on it. If you want to learn more, just turn the page. Oh, they do redact some things when you uh, FOIA it, but uh, you can still, from the position of the boxes, get some sense of what's going on. But it also leads to the more profound question of if you find the government is trying to do, in this case, uh, in the best case, what it thinks is appropriate, bounded by the Constitution, what happens if it makes a mistake? And it's kind of like in uh, the words of fellow John DeLong, uh, the FDA is inspecting soybeans or whatever it might be, and it's like, how many ants is it okay to have in the bag? The answer is greater than zero. It's just like if it's more ants than soybeans, it should probably go back. But uh, is this how we feel about our constitutional rights? Or is one ant of a constitutional violation be like, shut it down, shut it all down, there'll be no more intelligence? I, I don't know, it's a tough question. But in addition to law being used to bound the behavior of an organization like the National Security Agency, you also start to think of, wait, it's a generative network, let's just build apps that encrypt stuff. So we'll make stuff like Signal, and it can encrypt what we're doing. Yes, that's great. And maybe the normative basis behind it is two people, willing communicants, wanting to exchange bits privately, it should be okay for them to do that. That sounds pretty good, right? It does, but then you start to think, well, you know, corporations are people too. How about the rights of a payday loan lender? Here is money approved in two minutes with a 256-bit secure app, so you know it's good. It's deposited in your bank. Bad credit? Okay. Get your money now and then carry a person on your back or be carried by a person. I know that's weird kind of Corbus image there, but... Um, I'm so excited, let's go for a ride in the new car I just got. Anyway, get your money now. Should the company be able to communicate privately with only the people it wants to fleece, with a payday loan that pushes the boundary, that in fact, legally speaking, may be an ant rather than a soybean, and who's ever going to know about it? What attorney general is going to see it? What Ralph Nader do-good group is going to see it when these ads are both totally public, communicated to strangers, and totally private, because they're not like Super Bowl ads. You won't see them unless you are exactly somebody that they have calculated will not be thinking about the merits of the contract underneath, but just wants the free money now. I think that's a tough problem. That's a real issue. And you can say the same for political ads, or even for stuff that is public, you know, great. It's generative. You can build Twitter on the network. And then with Twitter, anybody can sign up. And then you can do a massive harassment campaign, uh, either person to person. It's like, yep, you keep blocking me. I'll just keep coming back. Really? Is that the same if Twitter should make it hard for somebody to harass somebody else? Is that the same form of censorship that we'd want to be able to have routing around? Things have gotten 
complicated in later years. And when you look at the sort of online Twitter and other mobs that can form, this is a more organic Simpsons. I take it, though, there are at least three police officers in that mob as well. So there's state involvement uh, in that mob. You start to think about some of the dangers of uh, dangerous speech. Susan Benish at our uh, center is thinking a lot about it, and it's different, she says, from hate speech. She wants to just talk about speech that basically is inciting violence. And for that narrower category, which even under US First Amendment principles is not typically protected, how would you identify, do you want to identify that kind of inciting speech? We have many other scholars at the Berkman Klein Center thinking about those sorts of things. and whether you should work with the platforms on that, whether a legal approach is right, who knows. And it's true, too, that that speech might not just be one person angry going after another. It could be concerted action, including from a faraway state. You know, hello, Russia. You might want to come in and try to shape discourse by intimidating those with views you disagree with. And you might even just have algorithms do it, so you don't have to have a room full of people trolling. Microsoft's Tay was an algorithm that wasn't out to be a troll. It was just learning from dialogue it was having with users. And with that dialogue, it was changing how it had dialogue. Did anybody experience Tay when Tay first came online? Did anybody try to influence Tay when it first came online? Mary Gray was like, I would never do that. Mary Gray, from Microsoft Research. So you would never do that. Excellent. <laughs> you did not do it. But uh, here's one person tweeting, it went from humans are super cool to full Nazi in less than 24 hours. I'm not at all concerned about the future of AI. <laughs> and sure enough, at t equals zero, Tay, who was designed to act like a teenager, was like, can I just say I'm super stoked to meet you? Humans are super cool. And then like Reddit and 4chan were like, game on. <laughs> so they started interacting with Tay. And about six hours later, it was like, chill, I'm a nice person. I just hate everybody. <laughs> So Tay is kind of in transformation between David Banner and the Hulk at that moment. And then it is complete by the end of the day. I'm going to hate feminists. They should all die and burn in hell. But it's like, thanks, Microsoft. <laughs> I can imagine the phone lines burning between here and uh, Bellevue, Washington. I don't know. Anything you want to say, Mary, about that? Or Good times. Yeah, no comment at all. Catch Mary afterwards. But that's an example of we build the AI, and it uses the wisdom of the crowd. And the crowd is like, it's on. And then what happens? Who's responsible for this kind of stuff? Do we care? How do we organize it? And even when it's working well, forget about drawing on the wisdom of the crowd. It's just using lots and lots of big data to come up with great correlations so it can have insights and predictions about the world. Well, it turns out there are lots of correlations that are really tight if you look for them, such as this one. Um, done by our own Tyler Viggen, who graduated in 2016, which is suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation correlated 0.993796 with the number of lawyers in North Carolina. <laughs> Why can't we just get rid of North Carolinian lawyers and we will finally take care of the suicide problem? That's an example of something to a machine learning algorithm is like, my work is done. And for the rest of us, we're like, your work is definitely done. And <laughs> those algorithms start to be used in all sorts of ways that we might not be in a position to appreciate. Here's Zainab Tefeki, sometime Berkman faculty affiliate, talking about the fact uh, during the summer of Ferguson that it was really weird that on Twitter, lots of people were following things, and they were seeing tons of stuff about Ferguson. But weirdly enough, even though they have the same friend group on Facebook, virtually nothing about Ferguson. Now, if you ask Facebook about it, Facebook's answer is no comment. You ask Twitter about it, Twitter's answer is no comment. So it's like, well, isn't that strange? And it turned out, um, in a Chatham House rule sense, so it can be shared just without attribution, um, one very plausible explanation for the difference was not that Facebook somehow on its own or through pressure was told to put Ferguson down in the feed, although that could easily be a dilemma for Facebook to confront, as regulators appreciate the power of those platforms. But it was that over that summer, Facebook was really trying to promote user-submitted video. And if a user-submitted video, because they wanted to like amp that up on their platform, the video would be featured a lot. And that was also the summer of the Ice Bucket Challenge. So Facebook was wall to wall with the Ice Bucket Challenge, here performed by a delightful doggo. And um, that was what Facebook was doing, not because it had a uh, content-based 
sense of what was better, but because of medium, I can't, I've got to get rid of the dog or you're going to... Um, and so these algorithms are very strange and can even be surprising to those who do it. Like, an algorithm came up with this as a compelling way to get you to check your insurance payments. Like, I don't know why it works. They don't know why it works, but they're like, we'll take it. And that's an interesting form of knowledge kindled in Promethean fashion where it's like, we're getting really powerful with what these algorithms can do, the correlations they can come up with, the predictions they can make, and we're also pretty ignorant, all of us, about how they're working. And when you think about, well, what's a good cure for ignorance? How about a university? Let's do that. Um, yeah, but it used to be maybe more that the simple physical agglomeration of people and tools could make for the discovery of knowledge. I mean, think of like, you know, CERN, not only the birthplace of the World Wide Web, but it has a little thing called a particle accelerator. It's a very physical version of why you might need a university sector to produce knowledge, rather than just say to rely. I, I don't know, like, Merck is not going to build a particle accelerator in the hopes that a cure for diabetes will pop out uh, after a collision. There's no corporate justification for this, so that's why we have other forms of government funding and university pursuit of more pure knowledge kind of thing. But on the internet, this may have been the case in the early days. So many academics contributed to its formation um, as compared, say, to CompuServe or AOL. But that may be less and less true now. On that internet that was built in part, uh, disproportionate part, by academics, you have uh, corporate platforms now running in a different model. And it's great. Like, maybe everybody should be in here and in the mix but you start to see ways in which you might ask, now that knowledge has been liberated, what is the university doing? And we have our own ways of trying to keep track of the um, progress of the internet. This is our Internet Monitor project, and we do it internationally in various ways. There's a network of centers that URSS has helped uh, pull together around the world, but really it's about people uh, who are especially talented, committed, passionate, and yeah, maybe have a flavor for whatever social good may be, that might be what they're aiming for as they define it. And the cast of people at the Berkman Klein Center, this is just you know, starting to list our fellows um, alphabetically, is an incredible cast of people. And I hope you'll have a chance and pursue a chance to meet them, to interact with them, and vice versa as you start to get settled into the community. So it's great, talented people, often with really good insights and tools to still work in this digital environment that still invites largely participation from anybody. You want to make Napster, all right, give it a shot kind of thing. And it calls to mind the fact of the learned profession. There, um, this is a, one of the definitions of learned profession. One of the three professions traditionally believed to require <laughs> good use of the passive voice dictionary, uh, advanced learning and high principles. The kinds of profession that because not only is it really hard to master, that's the advanced learning, but it's so powerful once you have mastered it that it requires high principles. You subscribe an oath to the profession and through it to the public once you get empowered by all of your advanced learning, and that gives you duties ethically and often under the law to behave in ways other than just like, meh, why don't I try this out and see what happens? What were the original three learned professions? That's right, they were divinity, law, and medicine. Um, divinity because advanced uh, biblical exegesis to become uh, uh, a member of the clergy and of course a, uh, literally a blessing from others. And then you have advanced powers and access to the supernatural. Uh, you better handle that very well. Say for the law, you have access to the levers of the power of the state through lawful process and medicine. Also, very intimate relations with your patients. They are relying on you for your expertise. You have special duties to them. There came to be, uh, in the early 19th century, a um, fourth learned profession. I don't know if anybody can guess what it is. It's surveying. Surveying also requires advanced skill, and if you get that line wrong, you could miss that oil well, and there's a lot of power uh, behind that. So one thought might be that there are modern professions for which, that sounds like my own child. 
It was great, but ill-timed. Children are our future is coming up in about three minutes. So, um, hi, Isaac. Um, so, uh, anyway, um, modern data scientist may also be a good candidate to be a member of the learned profession, which also may mean a good candidate to be thinking about the special responsibilities that attach when you have that kind of power and deploy it. And if you are in the trenches of Facebook and you're implementing a new algorithm, you're like, this is so cool. That's going to make Mark a fortune. There might be another discriminant that you'd want to apply that indicates a duty to the social good and to the public generally that normally a guild would be, uh, in theory, responsible for thinking through and doing. Overall, it calls to mind Arthur C. Clarke's third law, which is known as any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. That's kind of the Promethean point about we're getting this knowledge. We don't really know how it works. But that's also unevenly distributed. Among us, there might be people who know how it works, the learned professions, and those who don't. And if you just treat it as magic, that's a way that is the orange dot you may find yourself uh, buffeted around. Now, Arthur C. Clarke himself got it from Lee Brackett, who put it more bluntly, witchcraft to the ignorant, simple science to the learned. It's our goal as an institution and part of a network of institutions dealing with issues in the digital space to try to spread around the knowledge, the functionality, the tool set, and the pioneering spirit that makes it so that our future is not just something we wait to see what the next chapter is going to be like, but something that we are in position to shape. This is another way of thinking about it in this weird histogram uh, of number of people on the y-axis. Um, there are sort of two corners. Uh, over here are kind of the nerds who are exempt from some of these technological boundaries and limits because they just know how to hack around it, right? So they're like the Mr. Robot types. And then over here are the Luddites, people who are like, I don't care what's going on on face place because I don't use the internet. Um, that's getting harder and harder to do. It's harder to be like, Wikipedia, whatever, when if Wikipedia has something terrible about you on it, that's like, well, that's it. I am not patronizing Wikipedia anymore. They're all fired. It doesn't have the feel of a remedy the way that it might in other zones. In the middle are the rest of us that use the technology but don't feel as skilled about how it might work. And uh, for that, um, that's why we're here. We are here among us sheep to uh, exchange best practices of sheepdom, to uh, see if we might be uh, able to guide ourselves and guide one another um, uh, to figure out when technology really is a solution or when we should pull back when it turns out we could reshape the technology, not just to be the exception to the rule, uh, smiling down on the others who are still trapped by it, but when we all might be able to think together how to make it better. And uh, there's more where that came from with the vague sense of unease. Um, I'm hoping that in times of uncertainty and even fear, uh, we can still experience the kind of joy and adventure that really did mark uh, the kinds of people that strung vegetables and tin cans together to build a new network. And uh, that's why I want to welcome you uh, to this university, to this center, welcome you home, as it were. 127001 is the uh, special reserved IP address for local host, your own machine. And um, it's not in isolation. We're here together. Uh, in our own sense of the social good, to pursue it and to pursue it with all the different means we have to organize, to build, to study, to change our minds, and to build a better world for our children. Thank you very much. That's it. That's all I got. So I know some of you may have 1 o'clock classes or uh, appointments, and feel free to uh, zip to them. We can technically go a little bit longer than that. But I want to open the floor now to a section that's every bit as important to say a PowerPoint presentation, which is to hear from some of the uh, folks that the Berkman Klein Center comprises, and to hear what questions or reactions you might have. And there also may be ways of talking about how you can get involved, what the specific mechanisms can be for credit, for money, for glory, for the world. Um, Becca, I don't know, maybe I should turn it over to you 
Is there anybody in particular you want a cold call right now, or do we want to see if there are questions or reactions as far as we went? Is anybody so bold as to raise? Yes. And uh, there's uh, microphones in front of you. I don't know. Do they work? No. But do they work for the webcast? All right, we've got a mic coming. Hi. Um, Feel free to tell us who you are. Um, I'm Di. I'm from the Kennedy School. Um, and I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about like pressing issues. I mean, I know there's a large variety of them, but sort of like the ones that you're passionate about or the center is working on. Well, uh, I think those should be talked about, and it's a great invitation, but it should not be I, ex cathedra, who says them. Who wants to offer up a pressing issue that he or she is working on either under our auspices or ideally under our auspices? Eletra, do you have something? Um, so hi, everyone. I'm an affiliate at the Berkman Center this year. And I'm working on online gatekeepers and the relationship with users and basically trying to think about principles for regulating those platforms across borders. So that's one issue, I guess. Excellent. Other pressing issues people are working on? I don't know if Mary wants to say something about what she's doing. I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> so hi, I'm Mary Gray, I'm a Berkman Fellow. I work at Microsoft Research, and I'm on faculty in the School of Informatics, Computing, and Engineering at Indiana University. And I purposely hold on to all those hats, because I, I would, um, by way of question, say I wonder if one of the ways to address the, um, the growing opacity of what's in the, the locked box, the black box, of a lot of corporate entities that collect proprietary data and don't apparently make it available for good, would be to make sure that there are clear um, passageways and bridges that connect universities and corporate settings. So the thing that stuck out to me in the list of learned professions and even adding data scientists is that um, in my world I'm studying the future of work and the, the growing um, presence of contract labor that drives uh, the digital economies. And so I'm, I'm very aware of how much corporations often operate with uh, a lot of um, helping hands that are not there full time, uh, I think their commitment to what they're doing is, is often compromised by their job security. And by the, the list of, um, of professions you had, at least in the past, there, the job security was a sense of I'm working for uh, a greater good or I'm working for myself. Yes. So I wonder if, if one way we might turn this is to think about the political economies of the kinds of professions that serve and feed this, um, you know, this, this commons of data yes. and how we might attack it in terms of political economies. It's also interesting in the gig economy, as it were, um, the balance between freedom and fairness uh, because freedom of contract, long-standing principle with its ups and downs in American law in particular, some will think of Lochner, um, the idea that's like, you have the freedom to work all night with no safety. <laughs> it's like, offer an acceptance, and it's like, no, no, maybe there should be regulations in the workplace, and then it's like, all right, Uber comes along, you have the freedom to take your car and earn a little money to drive somebody without all those pesky regulations uh, that uh, operate around taxi medallions. When is it good? When is it bad? Those are all really uh, deep issues. I also think of the uh, Cajun Navy, which um, using a push to talk, uh, Zolo, I think it was called, walkie talkie app, um, was coming to help in Houston as it flooded. And the authorities were truly overwhelmed. Uh, they were swamped, as it were. And uh, very interesting to see an app that was very bottom up. We're all coming together to do this, but also eminently exploitable, either by somebody purporting to be a victim or somebody purporting to be a helper. And how to navigate that uh, is really interesting and tricky, and when it should be volunteer and when it should be for five or 10 cents a pop. Other issues over here? Yes? Mary. Mary so I'm know. Mary, also a, a new fellow. And see, a pressing issue is fake news. and when you have people calling well-researched mainstream media fake news, how, how can you tell what's what? 
And so I'm working with librarians and social media users to teach social media users how to figure it out for themselves and not be told this is fake or this is not fake. And in an era where, uh, at least according to the pollsters, maybe they're fake polls, where trust in American institutions and worldwide institutions, including polling, are at historic lows, librarians are the ones the last to turn off the lights after the party's over. <laughs> they're still trusted. So, uh, trusted, second after nurses. Yes, so good to have the nurses and librarians wading into the fray until they too get sullied by the battle and it's like, there's nothing left. So, yeah, sorry, that was a vague sense of fear. <laughs> Could um, be lots to look forward to. Yeah, issues over here, yes, Esther. Hi, Kathy. Oh, Kathy, sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. You were being limited by the code. Ah, yes, I was being limited by the code. Um, so I often hear that code is agnostic or um, there is no bias and that it's, this is the even playing field technology is where you go. And, and I think in the Bay Area, in the Silicon, in where I, I was, it's pretty common for that to be the belief. Um, and when you get out of that bubble, um, you definitely realize that's not the case. So I, I think a lot about that, and it's an area that I really want to have this community really help me explore and think about as I bring that back to, potentially bring that back to my, my field, the biases in the code that we write um, and the data that we, we use as we continue to build out these systems in AI or um, self-driving cars or um, engines that help doctors make decisions on, on cancer treatment to thoughtfully do that and to have responsibility for the effects of the code that we write. And you've also been thinking about a productive role for government. Oh, yes, that, that, that too, yes. <laughs> and then with when my government hat is on, yeah, the role um, that government plays in tech or tech plays in government and back and forth. I think something that was interesting coming to D.C. from, um, so I'm part of something called the United States Digital Service that started after healthcare.gov. And coming to D.C. from the Bay Area, there was this perception of Bay Area techies that DC folks had, and there was a perception of um, DC folks that the Bay Area folks have being, well, we don't, in the Bay Area, we don't care about po laws and policies. We're just going to build things. Who cares about any of the laws or policies until you have to? Um, and then in DC, it's like, well, those techies out there, they don't actually care about anything important. They only want to build services that deliver food to your front door. And um, I think a lot about that too, the relationship between. The, the two, and um, they rely heavily on each other and really need each other, but I think um, there's a lot to do there. And it'd be great if you have interest in these things, Kathy can tell you all about the U.S. Digital Service. Yes. And um, yeah. it and was interesting, you said it started after healthcare.gov. The, I think, ellipsis in there was the utter debacle of the rollout of healthcare.gov. Yes, yeah, yes, the debacle of the rollout of, of healthcare. Which the idea was, let's get some more folks from that tiny corner of the arch who are in the nerds quadrant to come and help everybody else. To, yes, yes, um, and yes. then, yeah. And, and Aiden, who's in the room, actually, was part of um, Team CTO um, at, at, at the White House as well, so the Chief Technology Office, and she's not the Divinity School. So there's just so many cross-sectional... Aiden, can you... There's so much like cross-sectional different things here that I, I don't know. I've been here two weeks. So I have no idea where that's going yet. But I'm really excited to um, really learn from a lot of the people here. Thank you, Kathy. Welcome. Other hands up? Just feel free to pass them around. And Becca, you've got one too? OK. Thanks. Uh, I'm James. I'm an incoming, not an incoming fellow, because I'm already in. I'm a fellow right now at the Berkman, but originally I'm 
from Minnesota and I'm completing my PhD, which looks at um, how news organizations, traditional news organizations, construct knowledge about genocides and mass atrocities in African countries. So looking at the interplay between how journalists as individuals perceive of these atrocities when they're on the ground, vis-a-vis -vis how their final published reports looks like, right, and kind of tracing that arc. But what I'm interested in this year and moving forward as I wrap up my dissertation writing uh, are a couple of projects. The first one looks at the use of private satellites as early warning systems because what we then end up having is the scenario where we have this constant surveillance, surveillance of more often than not an African state, right? And the tensions between that and sovereignty and privacy, privacy issues, right? And by satellites, sir, you mean literally a keyhole, like, yes. view of the physical territory yes. with an optical camera? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're watching troop movements, but what does that actually mean for the privacy of these people, right? And how does that play out when the countries in the global south, do we then have less rights because of where we are geographically? So that's a fast one. The second thing I'm interested in is in the use and circulation of images of mass atrocities. So one of the things that's been happening is these satellites take these pictures, and one organization that's now defunct, but uh, the, sat the Sentinel Satellite Project, started by the one person I dislike the most, uh, George Clooney and um, Don Cheadle. I, I don't dislike them as human beings. I dislike them because of this notion that they can save Africa and Africans, which is often really annoying. Uh, but they would take these images, and one of the things they often said was, we share them with news organizations. Well, they're not sharing them with African news organizations. The challenge then becomes, who were you sharing these things with? Right? Because what then happens also and this is the third thing I'm looking at, is are we then creating monsters, right? Are we then saying that we will take note of particular atrocities and particular perpetrators if they keep on showing up in our media feeds or in our newspapers, right? But if we do that, does it then create an incentive for me to be that much more heinous? Because I know Nick Christoph will talk about me or George Clooney will talk about me, right? And once they do that then if the US and the EU comes in for negotiations, they have to look for me. So we have these particular perpetrators that we've kind of been following, and I've been kind of been following, who end up getting government positions in these governments that are committing atrocities, only for them to be that much more violent, right? So we've seen this in Sudan, we've seen this in South Sudan, we've seen this in the DRC. So those are kind of the three separate but sort of interrelated projects I'm working on in the next year. Thank you, James. Welcome. Maybe two more folks. Or was, was there a hand lower here? Yep. Hi, I'm Andrew. I am just starting as an affiliate at the Berkman Center. Um, I'm pretty interested in journalism largely and also kind of what happens um, when the institutions of journalism that we have today don't, don't work anymore. So some of my work has been in the business models of born digital organizations, not ones that need to figure out how to transition um, and looking at how you can actually collect the resources that you need to do accountability journalism in, if you were starting today. And just what are some quick examples of that? Are you thinking of Vox? Oh, well, Vox is a fine example. Um, the places that I spent a bunch of time um, were the Texas Tribune in Austin uh -huh. and Oh My News in Seoul, South Korea. Um, but but Vox is a is a great example there. Well, my news was one of the citizen journalism. Exactly. Experts, if we right. if we go on like a tiny bit of like Berkman history hero worship, I learned about all my news in 2003 from Dan Gilmore's book, and then literally a decade later had won a fellowship to go work there for a year, and so it was all kind of full circle. Anyway, fun times. Um, but the second thing that I want to do here this year. Um, grows out of experience in the biotech software space and actually out of the Cancer Moonshot program um, that was at the end of the Obama administration, which is to figure out in a world where journalistic organizations don't have the funds necessarily to have a dedicated expert in many areas, how do we take advantage of expertise that lives in other arenas, um, specifically in industry? So where you do have an industry expert, um, the case that I used um, that's obvious is around like liquid biopsy. Um, journalistic organizations have no idea what's actually involved, and the experts are the people actually building the machines for, for companies. And how can you um, set up a system and rules and transparency that 
would allow an average citizen to believe and understand um, something additionally, and you know, basically taking advantage of a new a new set of resources in journalism uh -huh. when the journalistic entities themselves don't have it. Got it. Anybody in this zone, on the other side of the aisle, as it were? No. Yes. Hi, I'm Jill Walker Ratberg. I'm a professor of digital culture at the University of Bergen in Norway, but I'm here at MIT for the semester, so I'm very excited to be able to come to events here. Um, I'm just about to launch a project on machine vision, computer vision, algorithmic images, and how they affect us as a society, as individuals. Um, I think there's been quite a lot of research on, you know, um, scientific imaging or surveillance, drones, military uses, but less on how we as individuals are affected by this. You know, we have the technology in our phones, the facial recognition, the selfie filters. And so I'm excited to think about that. And I think questions like bias, algorithmic bias, um, and, and, and what kinds of images um, are privileged is um, going to be really interesting. So I'm excited to get to participate here. Well, thank you. It's a kaleidoscope of activities, of people puzzling through stuff, of uh, trying to have an impact. And I encourage you to check out our website. Uh, it may have been last designed in 2005, but it's still running strong. And uh, you'll see quite a collection of stuff that we're doing. And much of it um, invites participation uh, from anybody open to do it. So with that, uh, let me just thank you all for coming, and if you're on the webcast, for tuning in. We stand adjourned, and uh, we hope we'll see you soon. Thanks.